Welcome back to the Anti-Social Studies Podcast, a place for people who wish they'd stayed awake in high school. Last time we explored the post-classical East, Islam rose, China invented everything, Africa was crushing that gold salt trade, and then the Mongols took over everyone. Meanwhile, Europe had finally pulled itself out of the medieval era thanks to the increasing exchange after the Crusades, the breakdown of feudalism partly because of the Black Death, and the consolidation of political power into well-defined kingdoms. And remember, before we get started, if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my podcast. And if you really like what I'm doing, then go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give me a review. Okay, enough business. Let's get to history. Today, we're going back to the early modern era in the West, or as I like to call it, we missed two whole continents. We'll look at all the things in European history you heard about that one time you went to that museum what was going on in the Americas before 1492, and what happened when the East found out that there was a whole other half of the world they didn't know about. Awkward. This is Anti-Social Studies. I'm Emily Glenkler. Settle in, and let's go back in time. Act 1. The Ninja Turtles. Around 1450, European civilization is exploding with new ideas that challenge authority and the traditional ways of doing things. Why Europe? Why didn't China have a renaissance, or the Middle East a scientific revolution? Why didn't Africans create Enlightenment philosophy? Europe was specially situated to do all of those things. Their fragmented states allowed for competition, and a place to go if you say something your ruler doesn't like. So the English king wants to fund exploration so that his rival, the Spanish king, doesn't get there first. Or Italian city-states each want to finance the best art to make them the preeminent power in Italy. On top of this, separation of church and state gives more freedom to speak new ideas. You'll still probably be shut down, but maybe not in places that are developing a rule of law and a constitutional monarchy. All of this allows for more entrepreneurial endeavors. People start trying out new things because it's relatively supported by the government and there's a space to study things outside the church's watchful eye. And the new wealth coming into merchants after the Crusades funds secular universities, for example. Let's think about China as a counterexample, because they've been coming up with new ideas for centuries. But China is a massive land empire without real competition in the region to worry about, so there's really no need to develop innovative military technology. Their Great Wall is doing just fine. And their government is run by scholar bureaucrats who all have to take a rigid exam on Confucian ethics. By definition, everyone entering the government and thus gaining privilege and the ability to study is now confined to just studying the things that serve the government. Basically, most other civilizations on Earth are so massive and already powerful from the top down that people are not given the freedom or motivation to develop new ideas. But mostly I would just argue that Europe was coming up with their cool ideas at just the right time. The invention of the printing press and the development of navigation and military technology is going to allow them to spread their ideas around the globe and make us always remember them as important. Thanks, China, for all those inventions. A trend we're going to see across all aspects of European culture at this time is called secular humanism. Basically, it's the idea that scholars, artists, scientists, philosophers shouldn't spend all their time thinking about God and the heavens. Human beings and the natural world are also worth investigating. This upends the medieval idea of scholasticism. The church does not accept this. They excommunicate or imprison many figures because their discoveries will go against their teachings. But it inspires a lot of rebels in Europe. Artists start thinking about human subjects and depicting the human condition, scientists study the natural world, and philosophers start thinking about how government could serve the people instead of the other way around. For example, there is a Renaissance painting that I always show my class, and it's called The Bean Eater, and it is literally just a poor dude sitting in his tiny house eating beans. That's it. That's humanism. The idea that that guy was just as worthy of being painted as Jesus Christ is revolutionary. So how did we get there? During the medieval era, really the only institution funding art and scholarship was the church. So there were a lot of limitations as to what you could paint or study. So, I mean, you can only paint Jesus and Mary so many times before you start looking to other funding sources that will let you paint something, anything else. Guy eating beans, please. Similarly, the church funded science and research, but under the umbrella of scholasticism. Basically, people could study Aristotle and early church writings, but not much else. And any discoveries that were made that contradicted church teachings were immediately deemed invalid. This all changes thanks to the Crusades. The Italian city-states that rose were home to many wealthy merchants and banking families that grew rich off the thousands of ships coming through the Mediterranean toward the Holy Land. The most famous, of course, is the Medici. Thanks, Netflix. Cosimo de' Medici established his family as the political powerhouse of Florence with influence in Rome. 
the Medici family produced four popes. Italy was not united, but it was made up of various city-states with powerful families running politics, and these powerful families wanted a way to showcase their wealth and influence. What better way to do that than by financing art and education? I mean, it's the same today. Go to any university and see how many libraries are named after the rich donors. Some of the most famous Renaissance artists in Italy are the Ninja Turtles. Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Donatello. I've been told by another teacher that the creator of the Ninja Turtles wanted to name one after Titian. It's spelled T-I-T-I-A-N. But they were worried that kids would pronounce it Titian and create problems. We could talk about the Renaissance for hours, so I just want to focus on a few of the most famous works that you might have seen or heard of. My favorite is a painting by Raphael called The School of Athens, and it's still in the Vatican. You should check out the podcast appendix at antisocialstudies.org for a picture, but it basically shows dozens of important people from the ancient and classical era all lounging around and mingling in a massive building that looks like the inside of a basilica. Flanking the painting are sculptures, well, paintings of sculptures, of Apollo and Athena. At the center of the painting, we see Plato and Aristotle walking towards us in discussion. They are surrounded by tons of other people, and we don't know who each person is supposed to be, but there are some pretty good educated guesses that include Pythagoras, the triangle guy, Alexander the Great, Pericles, Socrates, Zoroaster, the founder of the Persian religion Zoroastrianism, and Ptolemy, the guy that started the Egyptian dynasty that ended with Cleopatra. So you can see why I love this painting. It's basically a who's who of notable historical figures. And this painting epitomizes the spirit of the Renaissance. After the Dark Ages, Europe had been reintroduced to Greek and Roman knowledge through its interactions with the Byzantines and the Muslims. And these artists, scholars, scientists, and philosophers wanted to pick back up where the classical era left off, basically just pretend that the medieval era never happened. A lot of their first non-religious art was glorifying the classical era. In fact, this is when we start to get the title of the classical era. Europeans very pointedly leave out other civilizations like Persia and China for the most part, but the time period of Greece and Rome is now talked about as the height of culture. It's classic. My second favorite piece of Renaissance art is Michelangelo's Statue of David, which stands in the Gallery of the Academy in Florence. If you haven't seen it, whoa. It is a massive 17-foot-tall marble statue of David from David and Goliath. And I mean, yeah, he's naked, but that's in keeping with the ancient Greek tradition of celebrating the beauty of the body, but it does make for some pretty interesting PowerPoints in my history class. Apparently, Michelangelo specifically sculpted David's hands larger than was proportional. A lot of artists did this to draw your eye to the hand, one of the notoriously hardest parts of the body to get right, especially in marble. By doing this, he's showing you just how skilled he was. You can see the delicate veins and muscles beneath the skin. I put a detailed photo on my blog. It's incredible. A lot of artists at this time depicted David because he was seen as the defender of civil liberties against a tyrannical giant. This is in keeping with the idea of humanism, that individual people have rights and should defend themselves against oppressive forces who try to stamp out those rights. Side note, Donatello also sculpted a really famous bronze statue of David just 70 years earlier that everyone sort of forgets about. Sorry, Donatello. And finally, we have to talk about the Mona Lisa. Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa in Florence at the same time that Michelangelo was chiseling out David. Man, can someone invent a time machine already? Gosh. Leonardo was a trendsetter in the Renaissance. He created dozens of sketches of his subjects, which inspired other artists to do the same. It allowed them to study the subject from a variety of perspectives or be more free in some of their interpretations. And he was the quintessential Renaissance man. He painted, he sculpted, he invented, he dissected. One of the ways artists were able to depict the human body so accurately is because they would dissect dead bodies to study them. This also advances a ton of new medical knowledge and can really only happen in a place where there's some separation of church and state, since most religions at the time aren't too keen on cutting up dead people. So, who was Mona Lisa? There are three main theories. The first is that it's Lisa del Giocondo, the wife of a Florentine merchant who would have commissioned the painting, and if he did, then man did he get his money's worth. The second theory is that it's Leonardo's mother, but this one mostly comes from Sigmund Freud. We get it, Freud. Everything's about moms. Just stop talking about it. You're creeping everyone else out. The third theory, and my personal favorite, is that it's actually a self-portrait of da Vinci, and he disguised himself as a woman as one of his famous riddles. I love this one so much, but I also desperately hope that every single sentence of the da Vinci Code is true, so I may not be the most reliable source. I'll be honest. I went to the Louvre. I raced through the museum to the crowd of people craning to get a good look. I pushed my way to the front to see the Mona Lisa, and I was incredibly disappointed. For one, it's really small, but also, like, I just don't get it. I mean, I trust the art historians and scholars who say it's a big deal, but I like a ton of other Renaissance paintings way better. 
So in preparation for this podcast, I googled, why is the Mona Lisa so famous? Really? And honestly, I couldn't find a great answer. Like, yeah, she has that enigmatic smile that Freud analyzed to death, but that's Freud. And yeah, there's depth and perspective in the painting, but I think the depth in School of Athens is way more impressive. And yeah, her eyes follow you and that's creepy, but I guess that's art. Some people look at something and love it and others like me just don't get it. But a lot of people in Europe loved it. The Mona Lisa was eventually owned by French kings and emperors before it ended up in the Louvre. Really, the painting might not have been the most famous painting in the world except for two things. First, in 1867, a famous poet wrote a poem about La Gioconda, the other name for the Mona Lisa. But more famously, in 1911, an Italian employee at the Louvre took it off the wall and walked out the door with it. It was lost for two years before he was caught trying to sell it to the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Like, did he not think anyone would notice? But also, I sort of have a lot of respect for this guy. Like, if I were an Italian, I would be pissed too that arguably our most famous work of art is sitting in someone else's museum. That must be how all of Africa feels. Hmm. At the same time that art was revolutionizing the way we see people, scientists were looking around at the natural world and figuring out some pretty cool things too, like gravity, microscopes, telescopes, and the fact that the Earth revolves around the sun. This is one that really made the church angry, because if heaven was above Earth, then heaven, and so also Earth, would be at the center of the universe. Copernicus was so afraid of the repercussions that he waited until just before his death to publish his findings. Later, when Galileo confirmed the heliocentric model, he was convicted of vehement heresy and kept under house arrest for nine years until his death. But slowly, secular institutions develop that protect artists and scholars who want to study the natural world. But once they start questioning things, like why can't we just paint a regular dude eating beans, they're not going to just stop at art. Act 2. Europe sticks it to the man. So the late medieval era is dominated by two institutions, the church and the monarchy. But now, people are considering the human condition, and they see individual people as valuable in addition to God and King. And this leads to two events that will break down the absolute power that the Pope and the King had over people's lives in Europe. And it's these two events that will set Europe off on a very different path compared to basically every other civilization on Earth. First, the Protestant Reformation. In 1517, a German monk named Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of his Wittenberg church. These were 95 complaints in the form of thesis statements, he must have taken an AP history class, that he had against the church. So what were some of the problems with the church by the end of the medieval era? For one, they were insanely wealthy. It is estimated that the church owned one-third of all land in Europe. And they didn't have to pay any taxes on that land. And also, they got free labor from peasants when they needed to, to till their fields or shorn their sheep or whatever you did in the Middle Ages. Finally, every Christian was expected to pay the tithe, or tax, to the church. Around 10% of your yearly income was supposed to be given to the church in the form of money or goods. There were years when the church had so much wheat from the tithe, for example, that it would rot in their silos while small farmers are struggling to put food on the table. Not a great PR move. Second, the church had a ton of influence. They had the power to excommunicate individuals from the church, which meant they would no longer be able to receive the holy sacraments like baptism, marriage, or being prayed over after you died. If you were a devout Christian, which most everyone was, this was a fate worse than death because it meant you couldn't get into heaven. And they had power over kings because they could issue a thing called an interdict, which basically meant that an entire kingdom would be excommunicated until the ruler bent to what the church wanted. Whoa. Finally, there was corruption within the church, and this was the stuff that Martin Luther was the most upset about. In the Middle Ages, most families practiced primogeniture, which means that the first son gets all the land. So if you were a second, third, or God forbid, fourth son, you might get money and influence, but you had to make your own name for yourself since you didn't inherit any land. Some of these sons became high-level merchants and will later be the ones investing in early joint stock companies, especially to buy up new real estate in the Americas. But others who wanted influence and power might enter the church. So it could look like this. You or your family makes a very generous donation to the church, and then the next day, you're named a bishop. It's pretty sweet for you, but it's also immoral, considering church positions are supposed to go to the most faithful servants of God, and it's a thing called simony. It's named after a guy named Simon in the Bible, who offered to pay Peter and John to teach him how to impart people with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was like, uh, nope, that's not how it works. But that was how it worked in the medieval church. 
The thing that really got Martin Luther fired up was the selling of indulgences. These were basically get-out-of-hell-free cards that you could get if you made a generous enough donation to the church. So originally, indulgences were intended to mean basically any way that you made up for the church indulging your sin. It could be community service, prayers, or acts of charity. But over time, acts of charity for people with money just became writing a check to your local priest so that he would absolve you of your sin. It's sort of like that kid who tried to argue that since he grew up so spoiled and rich and his parents never taught him right and wrong that he couldn't be convicted of his like DWI crime, like affluenza or something. Oof. Needless to say, this angered poor people who just had to do it the old-fashioned way and not sin. And it angered devout scholars of the Bible like Martin Luther, who read about Jesus and thought, eh, this doesn't seem like quite what he had in mind. Luther is a humanist who believes a lot of new and crazy things. He believes that individual Christians should learn to read the Bible for themselves, so he wants to print the Bible in vernacular languages, or the languages people actually speak, like French and German, instead of the traditional Latin that only the clergy could read. He believes that the church should be simpler and not accumulate so much wealth, and he definitely doesn't think they should be able to sell people pieces of paper that absolve them of their sins. So Martin Luther complains to the church and they excommunicate him. But Martin Luther had access to this new technology that had come over from China, thanks Mongols for reuniting Eurasian trade, the printing press. He's able to fire off a bunch of pamphlets like Tom Cruise manically typing up that email about why sports agents are terrible people or something. Other people read his angry manifesto, pick up their goldfish, and leave with him. Martin Luther was basically the Jerry Maguire of 16th century Europe. I've always said this. The church claims they haven't been selling indulgences, and Martin Luther's like, show me the money! And then when others break away with him and start calling themselves Lutherans, he's like, you complete me. Across the pond, there's an English king who Martin Luther had at hello. All right, I'll stop. Henry VIII had been having issues with the Pope ever since he wanted to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. The Pope refused because he didn't want to anger Spain, where Catherine's family still ruled. And I don't know if you've heard, but the Spanish are pretty Catholic. Anyway, Henry looks over and sees Martin Luther breaking away and is like, wait, we can do that? He breaks away and forms the Church of England, or Anglican Church, and puts the English monarch in charge. And you know the story. He annuls his marriage and ships Catherine and their daughter Mary off to Ireland, where they're all very angry and very Catholic, so they fit in just fine. Henry then marries Anne Boleyn, who dares to give him another daughter named Elizabeth, so he chops off her head. He marries four more times, has a son who's a total dud and dies at like 15, and ends up having to accept that his daughter will succeed him after all that trouble. So... It's really simple to say that Henry VIII left the church just to get a divorce, but really it was also a power grab. By kicking out the Catholic Church, he's able to take all of their land and wealth and give it to the crown. That's one of the reasons why his daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, is able to finance so many incredible things that she gets her own era, the Elizabethan age. She uses some of that money to promote the arts, hello William Shakespeare, and to finance ventures to the New World. But wait, back up. We have an English queen? You guys didn't think I was just going to skip past that, did you? And if so, then you have not been paying attention. Henry VIII was so concerned with his Tudor line continuing that before he died, he had Parliament sign a thing called the Act of Succession that recognized that his daughters could inherit the throne if their brother died, which he did pretty early in his rule. But you'll remember that Henry had two daughters, Catholic Mary and Protestant Elizabeth. And there are still a lot of politicians in England who are angry or terrified that Henry has pissed off the Catholic Church. They scheme to put Mary on the throne, who rules for a short time and murders a ton of Protestants. They call her Bloody Mary. Eventually, Elizabeth comes to power with the support of the Protestants. She has another Mary to deal with, her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, whom she sees as a threat to her power. She imprisons her and eventually has her killed. But just watch the CW's reign and you'll get the gist. So, in England, it is now acceptable to have a female ruler, if and only if there are no male heirs. Interestingly, this got changed just like two years ago. England finally passed a new rule that says that daughters don't get skipped if they have a younger brother. And so William and Kate's daughter, Princess Charlotte, is the first girl to not lose her place in line to her younger brother, the very new Prince Louis. Also, it's really ironic that Henry VIII did all of that to try to keep his family line going, because ultimately his daughter Elizabeth is never going to marry and the Tudor line is going to end with her. She was nicknamed the Virgin Queen because she never married, knowing that she would have to basically give up power to her husband if she did. Uh, So fun fact, the colony of Virginia is named after Elizabeth. Back to the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther's act sets off an explosion of other groups fracturing off from the church. Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Baptists, Anabaptists, Episcopalians, the list goes on. 
These groups are all collectively known as Protestants because they protested against the church. There were another group of protesters who focused on the absolute power of monarchs across Europe. Up until this point, European kings were believed to have the divine right to rule. Basically, they were ordained by God himself and could not be questioned. We see this across the world for most of history. Egyptian pharaohs were believed to be gods, Chinese emperors were given a mandate from heaven, and Islamic caliphs had inherited the mantle of power from Muhammad himself. In Europe, the poster child for an absolute ruler is Louis XIV of France. He built the palace at Versailles, funded the arts, establishing France as the center of European culture, and he significantly reduced the power of his nobles by making them all come and live with him in his court. One of the most coveted court positions was to be the man who got to dress the king in the morning. Powerful nobles would sleep outside Louis's bedroom, hoping to be invited in the morning to help him get ready. Louis also had incredible hair. Check out a picture at antisocialstudies.org. Side note, y'all know that the men during this time period all wore wigs because their hair fell out because they all had syphilis, right? Yeah. The disease came from the newly discovered Americas and traveled back from the New World and ravaged European high society. It's the ultimate Montezuma's revenge. In England, only the closest member of the court was selected to be the king's gentleman of the stool. This position meant that you had the ear of the king and could have a ton of influence because you were with him at his most vulnerable. Your job was to help the king use the toilet and then wipe his ass. Really. So some humanist philosophers started to question this whole setup. Like, maybe government shouldn't be so one-sided, where the king gets to do whatever he wants, and everyone else has to just deal with his crap. Literally. I'm sure other people had questioned this thousands of years ago, so why does it work now? Really, the answer is the printing press. This invention by Gutenberg, China had invented all the different parts, but Gutenberg put them all together into a new machine. It allowed for information to be shared and improved way faster than ever before. It was like the internet of the 15th century. Now people across Europe could start to get in touch more easily and see that there were other like-minded individuals who also wanted change. Also, Europe had fractured into separate kingdoms, so instead of being under the singular power of an emperor with nowhere to go, now if you disagreed with your leader, you could hop across the border and find somewhere that was a little more lenient, like England. Thanks, Magna Carta. Finally, some pretty huge events over the past few hundred years had caused people to question the old way of doing things. Christians losing the Crusades, decreased trust in the church and the pope, the increase in literacy, thanks in part to Martin Luther's push to get people to read their own Bible, created a new middle class who could read and think for themselves. Universities had been established by merchant families like the Medici, who had gotten rich off the crusade trade. And some guys had just discovered that two entire continents exist that no one knew about. So people are starting to look around and question everything, including their rulers. This period of time is called the Enlightenment. Keep in mind, it's happening at the same time as the Renaissance, the Scientific Revolution, the Protestant Reformation, and the Age of Exploration. And we think our news is jam-packed. We could spend a ton of time on this, but the discussions boiled down to two ideas typified by Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. They disagreed on the basic essence of human nature. Thomas Hobbes believed people were bad and needed to be governed by an absolute ruler who had complete control. John Locke believed people were good and could share power with their ruler who would have to abide by a constitution. Sound familiar? It's the legalism-confucianism debate in China all over again. Hobbes would have been BFFs with Shi Huangdi, and Locke would have been a scholar bureaucrat. But really, the guy you should know about is just John Locke, because the United States basically copied and pasted his writing and called it the Declaration of Independence. Locke proposed that the government and the people had a social contract, and when the government stopped doing its part in serving the people, the people have the right to overthrow their leader and institute a new government. It's basically like the loophole the Chinese have had in the Mandate of Heaven for years. Locke also proposed that people have basic inalienable rights that cannot be taken away. Life, liberty, and property. You thought I was going to say the pursuit of happiness, didn't you? Nope. The Founding Fathers weren't too keen on guaranteeing everyone the right to property in the United States. That's what made them special. So they switched it to the pursuit of happiness instead. Tricky, tricky. Keep in mind, these new ideas about government don't get put into action during the early modern era. Guys just start writing about them. Montesquieu writes that a government would be most effective with three branches that check each other's power. Voltaire proposes that people should also have freedom of speech and religion. And a woman named Mary Wollstonecraft is going to propose that women should probably be included in all of this too as the people who get rights. But everyone else is like, ugh, Mary, quit getting all emotional and nagging is about rights. We'll get to you when we get to you. <sighs> Act 3. 1491. 
Y'all, I'm really excited about this section for two reasons. One, I feel bad that the Americas have been ignored for the first few eras of history. But two, I studied Latin American history in college, and so I can't wait to finally put my degree to use. Take that, Dad. Civilizations in the Americas developed slightly differently than civilizations in Eurasia. First, they lacked two key factors in Eurasian development, river valleys and diverse domesticated animals. Sure, they have llamas and alpacas, but that's it. No horses, no ox, no nothing. Also, like I mentioned in an earlier episode, since they're oriented along a north-south axis, their civilizations are more isolated from each other. It's way more difficult for people to go from Canada to central Mexico and into Peru. And for a long time, we thought that didn't happen. But just recently, archaeologists have discovered evidence that people did just that. We have found ancient macaw feathers from South America and the American Southwest, and turquoise from modern-day Arizona and Peru. But since they didn't have pack animals across those regions, that meant that the majority of that trading happened on the backs of people, which makes it slower and more rare than Silk Road trade, for example, but also way more impressive. Anyway, by the 1300s, two important American civilizations had risen that we need to know about. In modern-day Mexico, there were the Aztecs, and in Peru, there were the Inca. Today, I'm going to just talk about the Aztecs because I love them. Also, I'm planning a whole special episode on the Inca after I finish season one, because this summer, I'm taking a group of 12 teenagers to Peru. I know, how brave of me. So come back after season one and check that episode out. But for today, let's go to Mexico. So Mexico was populated by a variety of tribes and civilizations for millennia. While ancient Egypt was thriving, the Olmec were carving massive stone head statues. While Islam was rising, the city of Teotihuacan was thriving in central Mexico, and the Mayans were building pyramids like Chichen Itza in the Yucatan. And while Charlemagne's empire was breaking apart into the various European kingdoms, the Toltecs dominated the region. Supposedly, a nomadic group of warriors known as the Mexica, it's spelled Mexica, wandered down from the north. Okay, and I'm going to be a little snooty here, but the actual name for this group is the Mexica, but everyone knows them as the Aztecs because that's what others referred to them as, meaning from Aztlan, a region in the north. So to simplify things, I'm going to call them the Aztecs, even though it hurts my little Latin American studies heart. The Aztecs rose to prominence as mercenary soldiers, fighting for other more powerful civilizations. Soon, their reputation preceded them, and when they tried to find a place to permanently settle, other groups, fearful of having fierce warriors as their next-door neighbors, kicked them out of all the good land. According to legend, the Aztecs wandered central Mexico until they came upon a lake with a small island in the middle. There they saw an eagle eating a snake perched on top of a cactus. They took this as a sign from the gods that this would be their new home and the future flag of Mexico. Well, I don't think they knew that part, but it happened. Now, this wasn't an ideal place to build a city, and by that I mean it's probably the worst place to have to build your city. But the Aztecs proved to be incredible engineers. They drained parts of the lake and built up the land in the middle to create the city of Tenochtitlan. Basically, the entire city was surrounded by the rest of the lake, and huge causeways were built so that there were three main roads into the city. And to build these, people had to dive down to the bottom of the lake, dig massive holes, and insert huge wooden supports, all without modern technology and while holding their breath. It's crazy. The Aztecs also built my favorite agricultural innovation, the chinampa. Chinampas were essentially floating gardens of earth on top of the lake where the Aztecs could grow what they needed just outside their doors. They would basically make underwater fences where they could intertwine reeds to create artificial islands. Small boats would weave in between the gardens to tend to the plants. Basically, the Aztecs took an unlivable swamp and turned it into a thriving city of 5 million people, the same size as Paris and Naples at the time. But the Aztecs weren't content to just live in their swamp island city. They were conquerors. Through a series of conflicts, the Aztecs and their allies came to control most of central Mexico. Other groups were forced to pay tribute to the Aztecs in the form of goods and people. This system is very similar to one that was going on in China just a few hundred years earlier. The Tang Dynasty had also subjugated surrounding areas like Korea and Vietnam and forced them to pay tribute as well. And I mentioned that part of the tribute system was to give people to the Aztecs. And now we get to the part of Aztec history that most people, especially teenagers, like to fixate on, ignoring all the other incredible advancements, but like, yeah, I know, they practiced human sacrifice. Okay, just to be clear, I, Emily Glankler, do not endorse human sacrifice. But hear me out, it's important to understand the historical context of human sacrifice. This practice was really common in prehistory, basically the Paleolithic era. We found evidence of human sacrifice in prehistoric villages in modern-day England all the way through Africa and Asia. 
In Japan, there are legends of a human pillar where they would consecrate a new building by burying a young woman alive to protect the building against disasters or enemy attacks. Homer's Greek epics mention King Agamemnon sacrificing his own daughter to appease the gods. And even in the Bible, God supposedly asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, but at the last minute he stopped him and revealed it was a test. But the Aztecs did commit human sacrifice on a scale rarely seen in world history. When they reconsecrated the main temple in Tenochtitlan, reports tell us that they sacrificed about 80,000 people over four days. They had a yearly calendar of religious festivals, many of which included specific types of human sacrifice. On some days, young virgins were to be killed, whereas other ceremonies called for prisoners of war. During some, they would tear out the heart while the person was still alive, and documents talk about rivers of blood flowing down the steps of the temple. So, yeah, pretty bad. But context is important. The Aztecs didn't commit human sacrifice because they were just bloodthirsty barbarians, or cannibals as some historians have irresponsibly implied. It goes back to their belief system. The Aztecs worshipped a main sun god named Huitzilopochtli. Dib's baby name. Side note, I was shocked because Microsoft Word recognizes the name Huitzilopochtli. Like, when I typed it out, it didn't give me that red underline, which I consider a huge win for global historical understanding. Like, good job, Microsoft, for knowing your Aztec gods. Anyway. The Aztecs believed that this god's job was to lift the sun up into the sky every day and allow life to continue. And apparently the sun's pretty heavy, so with all that lifting, he needs some extra strength. So human sacrifice and blood was basically like Huitzilopochtli's protein shake each morning before he goes and deadlifts the sun for all of humanity. Also, it's important that we understand that almost all of what we know about the Aztecs was written after they were conquered by the Spanish, and this is a theme we should be noticing. A lot of the quote-unquote bad guys of history— Shihuangdi, the Mongols, the Aztecs, are just the ones who didn't get to tell their side of the story. Most Aztec writing was destroyed during the conquest, and we do have sources written by young Aztec men, but they were under the watchful eye of Christian monks who wanted to make sure they proved how uncivilized the Aztecs were before they got there. Also, these young men had just experienced an insanely traumatic event. The only decent analogy would be a full-scale alien invasion of planet Earth. That's what it felt like from their perspective. So a lot of their writings are trying to re-examine the Aztec way of life to figure out what they did wrong to have this happen to them. It doesn't make what they wrote untrue, but it does give most of their writings a more negative tone than is probably fair. The best example of this conundrum is also one of my favorite mysteries in world history. I love it so much I wrote my graduate thesis on it. So the traditional textbook story goes like this. Before the Aztecs rose to power, there was a Toltec king named Topiltzin who tried to stop the practice of human sacrifice. He was cast out of the tribe, came across the Toltec god Quetzalcoatl, a feathered serpent, and they, like, merged somehow? It's not really clear. Anyway, they come back to the Toltec tribe and vow to return one day for good, to reassert their power over the people of central Mexico, at which point they sail off into the east and are never heard from again. Fast forward to 1519. Hernán Cortés lands on the beach of Mexico, where there are Aztec spies who've been camped out for days checking out the mountains on the sea. That's how they describe the Spanish ships. When Cortés and his men land on the beach, they are wearing steel armor that gleams in the sunlight, and they're riding horses, animals the Aztecs have never seen. First, let's pause and think about how terrifying that would be. The spies report back to the last Aztec emperor, Montezuma, who believes that the legend had come true and the god Quetzalcoatl had finally returned to take control of the region again. He gives up, invites Cortes in, believing him to be a god, and that's his downfall. Okay, so it's not crazy to think that they might have at first been at the very least incredibly scared or confused by these white dudes showing up with guns, steel, and horses. And the fact that disease swept through the empire even before they showed up would not have looked good to the relatively superstitious people of the Aztec Empire. But for a long time, this version that Montezuma believed Cortes to be a god was the go-to story, and it played right into the idea that the Aztecs were dumb, backwards, and deserved to be conquered. For instance, the quintessential book about the conquest of Mexico was written by American William H. Prescott in 1843. This was during the era of Manifest Destiny and on the eve of the Mexican-American War. People in the U.S. especially were glad to learn any story that made non-white Americans, especially those in Mexico, seem less than them, because it made them feel slightly more justified in, oh, I don't know, conquering their land and or enslaving them. But more recently, historians, like myself, not so humble brag, have reevaluated the story and come to see Montezuma in a very different light. After doing a lot of research, here's my version of the story. Montezuma clearly recognized that Cortez was something different. 
Maybe Cortez was the descendant of Quetzalcoatl, who had gone away for a while, started a new line of rulers in the east, and this guy, Cortez, was the final result. But the Aztec em- emperors also believed themselves to be descended from the Toltec gods as well. So basically, he might have believed Cortez to be like his long-lost cousin, part god like himself. And this explains why he was somewhat fearful, but also respectful of Cortez. He sent emissaries out to greet him with gold and women, and he watched as Cortez marched through Mexico toward Tenochtitlan and eventually invited him in. It's only polite when you have a semi-divine being in your neighborhood. But Montezuma was not dumb. The problem was just that he didn't understand the true intentions of Cortez. Montezuma approached this interaction as a diplomat, but Cortez was a conqueror. Montezuma made tons of efforts to establish peace and negotiate with the Spanish, but they didn't want that, and they had enemy tribes of the Aztecs and guns to back them up. So the Aztecs gambled on diplomacy, invited the Spanish in, and lost. Act 4. In 1492, Columbus got lost, bumped into land, and ruined it. Okay, how are the Europeans able to go out and discover this other half of the world? And why was it Europe that went out and explored and conquered and not Africa, the Middle East, India, or China? There's a few things. First, the Europeans were struggling to compete with these massive Afro-Eurasian empires. Europe was fragmented and couldn't really control a ton of landmass, and so instead they took to the water and decided to dominate the seas. African, Middle Eastern, and Asian empires were doing fine as they were. They didn't really have the same desire or need to go out and find new trade relationships. Everyone was coming to them. Europeans were also able to do this thanks to the exchange of innovations from China. The new scholars of the scientific revolution took these innovations like the compass and improved them to serve Europe's new seafaring focus. Because individual kingdoms were competing with each other for dominance, governments funded these expeditions. Like Portugal's Prince Henry the Navigator founded a navigation school to teach people how to explore the seas. And Spain sends Columbus out, hoping he can reach India before their competition in Portugal, England, or the Netherlands does. Finally, Europe had two aspects of their society that a lot of other Afro-Eurasian civilizations didn't. First, they had growing capitalism. As some European kingdoms started to recognize the rule of law, individuals felt more comfortable taking risks and trying to make money for themselves, knowing that some of those founding documents, like the Magna Carta, would protect them from the government seizing everything for themselves whenever they wanted to. But also, Europeans had a Christian mission. Christianity is one of the few religions who has a main focus of proselytizing or actively spreading the faith. Buddhism is the other main one, and it spread really quickly all across Indian and East Asian trade routes. And remember, the Protestant Reformation has just taken a lot of people away from the Catholic Church, so countries like Spain are looking for new people to bring to the Pope. So kingdoms are competing with each other, and thus are encouraging their people to go out and find cool things to make them more powerful than other European kings. Scientists have adapted Chinese technology so that ocean exploration is more possible. Individuals looking for wealth and fame feel relatively protected by the rule of law back home. And there are also Christians who want to go and convert and save as many quote-unquote heathens as possible. All right, so in my opinion, all of these explorers and conquistadors have already gotten too much PR in world history. Like, yeah, yeah, we know. Columbus was an Italian who sailed on behalf of Spain looking for India. He found the Americas and screwed everything up. Quick note, most scholars throughout history have understood that the world was round. Columbus wasn't proving anything. And like, yeah, Magellan was the first to circumnavigate the globe or go all the way around, but he didn't even do that. He died halfway through his journey and his crew finished the trip without him. So instead of talking about those guys again, what I want to talk about instead of exploration is the conquest of the Americas itself and three key facts or ideas that are often overlooked. A lot of this is based on a book called Seven Myths of the Spanish Conquest by Matthew Ristall. It's a great book if you're into this kind of thing. The first is what Ristall calls the myth of completion. Basically, the way we teach the conquest is that it occurred in the early 1500s, and once the Spanish had militarily conquered the Americas, then they were conquered, and that was it. But we ignore the fact that conquest involves a lot more than just political and military power. So, yeah, the Spanish took control of the government, but it takes a lot more than that to fully conquer a place. This process took centuries, and some would argue was never fully finished. Socially, the Spanish subjugated the natives, putting them into a racialized caste system with white Europeans or peninsulares at the top, and natives and new African slaves at the bottom. In the middle were groups we call castas, or castes, including mestizos, or people of both European and native descent, and mulatos, or people of both European and African descent. Another way that they culturally conquered the the Americas was they forcefully converted the natives, using something called the requerimiento, or the requirement. 
When they arrived in a village, they would gather everyone together and read them this document asking them to renounce their pagan religion, accept the one true God, and serve the Spanish king as representative of the Pope. People who refused were imprisoned or executed. Oh, yeah, and it was read in Spanish to a bunch of indigenous people who didn't speak Spanish. Obviously, the first generation of conquered people probably didn't truly accept Christianity, most of them at least. We have tons of evidence of small rebellions, people fleeing villages and setting up shrines to the old gods in the mountains, or just worshipping Catholic saints who represented other old deities. For example, the Aztecs had worshipped uh, Tonantzin, a mother goddess. So when the Catholics showed up with Mary, they thought, meh, close enough. The Spanish played into this because it made conversion easier. For example, the first temple to Our Lady of Guadalupe was built on the site of the Aztec worship of Tonantzin. But after the first generation or two, young people were raised Catholic, young boys were educated in monasteries, and so the conversion process was more complete. But even today, Latin American Catholicism is very different from European practices because of this syncretism, or mixing of old and new beliefs. The second aspect of the conquest that doesn't get talked about is the importance of native allies. When we ask how Cortes was able to conquer the impressive Aztec civilization with only a few hundred men, that's really problematic, because he actually amassed an army of native people who had all been pissed for a long time that the Aztecs had conquered them and forced them to pay tribute. Even during peacetime, these natives weren't safe. The Aztecs would go to other rulers, sit down and commiserate over how they were running out of prisoners of war to sacrifice to the gods. And to solve this problem, the leaders would negotiate so-called flower wars. The Aztecs would schedule a war with someone else so that each side could win prisoners. There were certain rituals that required the sacrifice of a man defeated in battle. So they would go fight, capture each other's men, and kill them. So when Cortes comes along and says he wants to take down the Aztecs, a lot of people are like, yes, please. And the most important native ally is the real star of the story. She's a native woman named Malintzin. Malintzin was from a smaller tribe that was conquered in the Yucatan, and she was sold into slavery and eventually became part of the group of women that was given to Cortes when he arrived in Mexico. She was originally the mistress of one of Cortes's men, but he quickly recognized her intelligence and took her as his own mistress and personal assistant. Since she had been enslaved by the Mayan people, she spoke both Mayan and Nahuatl, the common language of central Mexico, including the Aztecs. Cortes also had a priest with him who'd been shipwrecked a few years earlier and spent years living with a Mayan tribe, so he spoke Mayan and Spanish. And what ensued was a game of telephone with the fate of the Americas in the balance. Cortes would speak Spanish to the priest, who would translate it into Mayan to Malincin, who would translate it into Nahuatl for the Aztecs and other tribes. Oof. But Malincin was so smart that she learned Spanish in months. Cortes no longer needed the priest in the middle, and Malincin became Cortes's principal translator, central to all of the negotiations between himself and the native people, including Montezuma. Cortes referred to her as la lengua, or his tongue, in his letters back to Spanish King Charles V. Malincin and Cortes eventually had a son together named Martin Cortes, who's considered the first mestizo person. Somewhat surprisingly, Hernan Cortes recognized his son, even though he had a first wife back home in Europe. That must have been a bad conversation. He brought Martin back to live with him in Spain, although Martin would return to the New World as an adult. His son was given a fantastic education, made a knight of the Order of Santiago, and he served as a page to King Philip II, arguably the most powerful Spanish king until his armada gets beaten by Elizabeth. Malincin has mostly been forgotten or maligned by history. A lot of historians, especially in Latin America, have seen her as a traitor since she helped Cortes conquer Mexico. She was nicknamed La Malinche, based on a different translation of her name, and the term Malinchismo today means a person who denies their own cultural heritage by preferring foreign culture. But that's really unfair. Mexico was not a united single culture when Cortes showed up, so this idea that Malincin was a traitor to her people is totally inaccurate. Her people were conquered and subjugated, enslaved, and sold to Cortes. So it makes perfect sense that she might help Cortes against the people who destroyed her home. Also, hello, she was a slave woman. She didn't really have a lot of choice in the matter, and even if she had wanted to resist, her survival was on the line. Malintzin's reputation is getting a makeover, partly thanks to a fantastic book about her life called Malintzin's Choices by Camilla Townsend. If you're into women's stories and history, this book is seriously a must-read. So, Europe is slowly modernizing. By the early modern era, they've challenged the authority of absolute rulers and the Pope. They're exploring new art and science, and also exploring new parts of the world. Even though there are a lot of new ideas floating around Europe, many of them haven't been fully put into action yet. It won't be until the next era that Europe becomes truly modern. 
The scientific revolution will grow into industrialization, exploration and colonization will become full-scale imperialism, and the new political philosophies of the Enlightenment will be implemented by a few pesky colonists who believe in annoying things like rights and representation. The world is clearly changing. Sea-based power is on the rise as plucky upstart Europe is increasing its influence on both sides of the Atlantic. But the clunky, land-based empires in Asia aren't getting the memo. They still see power in the form of land, like the old-style classical empires, and they don't give much credence to the new European advancements. Big mistake. To be continued. For notes, pictures about some of the things I mentioned, links to sources, and a transcription of this whole episode, check out the Season 1 page at antisocialstudies.org. Join me next time on Antisocial Studies as we explore the early modern era in the East, or as I like to call it, they didn't get the memo. And don't forget that if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my podcast so you'll know when the next episodes are up. And if you really like what I'm doing, then go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give me a review. Thanks. Thanks.